Thank you all for joining us this evening. On behalf of the School Counseling Department, I'm Cheryl Thomas. I'm joined today with Rebecca Castellano in welcoming you to this presentation on the financial aid. We are definitely, we're doing closed captioning right now. We're also recording the presentation. At the end of the presentation, you can put any questions that you may have in the Q&A, and we will answer them as best as we can. I would like to welcome our Assistant Director of Admissions from Iona University, Danielle Zalamea, who will talk about the launch of the 24-25 FAFSA form and the recent updates that have been implemented. Thank you, Danielle. Horace, thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. So I'm just going to share my screen and then we can get started. So, all right, awesome. So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, my name is Danielle Zalamea. I'm our Assistant Director of Admissions at Iona University. Um, so I'm going to be discussing about the new changes of FAFSA and really understanding the financial aid portion. So the first thing is what is financial aid? So financial aid is the assistance that you need financially, right, under circumstances that you would use to assist your overall costs for your college education. So when we're talking about financial aid, we are going to be going over certain terms. So the first one being merit-based, the second one being participation-based, and the third being need-based. So I'll define these three topics um, in more detail as we go along. But the financial aid terms to keep in mind is student aid index. So previously with FAFSA, right, or financial aid, they used to use estimated family contribution or an abbreviation EFC. However, now they're making some changes where they're using SAI. So it works very similarly to EFC. However, just keep in mind of that switch. Now, when you're looking at financial aid in those packages as well, you're going to be seeing direct costs a lot. So direct costs refers to their tuition, the fees amounts, and the room and board. If you see on some packages, room and board could be called something differently, such as food and housing. Essentially, room and board and food and housing refer to the same thing. The next thing we're going to be talking about is indirect costs. So the indirect cost refers to the travel aspect, the books, discretionary fees, right? So schools sometimes implement a book fee or they might make it optional, or let's say you're um, looking into transportation to the school, such as commuting. So that's what it means by the travel cost. Now, the cost of attendance would be a simple formula. So that would essentially be your total, your direct cost plus your indirect cost to get your cost of attendance. Your financial need is, again, a simple formula. So that would be your cost of attendance minus your SAI. So again, remember, it used to be EFC. Now it's SAI, and that will equal your financial need. Then the next thing is the total offers and awards. So this is essentially what you're receiving from the institution, and this could entail scholarships, things of that nature. And lastly, your net price is essentially your cost of attendance minus your total award. So the net price is what you're paying out of pocket. A few more important terms to go over as well is the FAFSA and CSS profile. We'll dive in a little deeper into what those two profiles are. Then we're going to be talking about grants and scholarships, as well as loans, as well as work study and full need met. So like I mentioned, there are three types of financial aid. So first we have merit-based and then we'll go over participation-based and need-based. So when we're talking about merit-based aid, this is essentially about your academic performance. So when looking at applying for merit-based aid, uh, most colleges and universities consider those students automatically at the time of their application. I would always encourage you to inquire within those admissions departments for the schools that you're applying to, because some schools might need an application. For majority of schools, they don't. You're automatically considered. So when we're talking about merit-based aid, like I said, it's about your academic performance. So your GPA, for example, schools can utilize a combination of academic credentials. So not just GPA, let's talk about scores. 
right? So SATs, ACT scores. I know a lot of schools are test optional now, but again, just inquire within those schools to see if they require those test scores, um, at least for consideration in merit-based aid. Now, merit-based aid tends to be a large piece of your financial aid. It tends to be a big chunk. So what I would recommend in terms of a helpful hint would just to be um, attentive or pay attention to those application deadlines just to make sure you don't miss out on any opportunities. Now, when we're applying for participation-based aid, so these are awards contingent on your involvement to a certain activity or program in, on campus. So this can mean athletics if you're involved in a certain sport or maybe you do community service, or you're part of the honors program, something of that aspect. So this could also mean like performing arts. So different schools have different participation-based awards. So always, again, inquire within those schools to see what additional awards you could apply for, or let's say something you're automatically considered. I'm going to use Iona for an example. We have participation-based awards on community service and performing arts, and those two awards are two that you would apply for. So again, you're going to have to pay attention to the deadlines and then be in contact with the admissions office regarding that. Then every application or let's say um, inquiry for these participation-based um, participation aids are very different or they could be similar. So some applications require a simple application or they can include a certain essay, or maybe you need an interview to be considered for that aid. So just be mindful of that. Now, when we're looking into applying for need-based aids, so FAFSA is the one you're going to be hearing a lot. So FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Now, you can access this um, application through the studentaid.gov website, or you can download the mobile app to make it a little easier. The next one is the CSS profile, which is a college board document. The FAFSA has some changes. So previously, the FAFSA has opened, for example, for the senior class on October 1st of every year. Now this year it's changing, so it's opening in December. There's no official release date yet as if it's going to be in the beginning or end of December. However, a lot of people are expecting towards the end of December. So. FAFSA does take the tax information from the previous year's use, so about two years prior. So make sure you have those informations handy as well. And I would always recommend the parent and the student to complete this application together, at least so you're both on the same page and you understand. So make sure you also use the student's information when filling out the student's FAFSA and not the parent's information when you're filling out a student's FAFSA. So the step-by-step -step process for FAFSA is simple, but not simple. So basically you're going to create an account. You're going to have an ID. Now your FSA ID and your password, for example, should be something not too complicated, but also not too easy to figure out, but it should be memorable. So you wanna make sure you have that handy. Personally, what I would do is I would put it in my notes in my phone and just lock that. Um, so at least it's private and it's safe and you know exactly where it is. So again, you could also start your FAFSA at fafsa.gov. That's also another website. And then you're going to just go along step-by-step, step, fill out the demographic section, section, like your biographical information. You're also going to list the schools. So it's going to ask the schools that you're interested in. You can search the schools up by name, but every school as well has a FAFSA code. So you can always find that code on the school's website, or you can call their financial aid office or their admissions office to find out that code. So for the list of schools on the FAFSA application, usually on the PDF version, they allow a maximum of 10 schools. I believe on the online version of it, on the digital copy, they're allowing 20 schools. So just make sure you're putting the schools that you are applying to and that you are highly considering. And then you're just gonna go along the list and answer the dependency questions, the parent demographics. Again, you're going to supply the financial information and they take the the IRS data directly from that too. So you're gonna sign it and you're gonna finish it and submit it. Now, the other thing I mentioned was the CSS profile. So like I said, this is a college board document essentially to see if there's any additional scholarship or aid that we can provide. Not every school has a CSS profile or requires one. So definitely inquire again with their departments to see if you would need to submit it. So again, I'm going to use Iona as an example. We don't require the CSS profile. We just require the FAFSA. 
So this opens October 1st of the student senior year. So it's November 2nd now, so it's open. And it's very similar to the FAFSA in terms of the questions asked, but it is a little more complex because they do go a little more into detail. Now, one benefit of the CSS profile is that you only need to complete it once, whereas the FAFSA, you need to apply every year for it. So the results of the need-based aid, so we have grants, we have scholarships, we have federal and state money. Now, when looking at the federal state money, you're going to notice the federal Pell Grant, the New York State TAP. So these are grants given to the student based off their information on their FAFSA application. If they meet the requirements, they will receive these awards or state or federal money. They do not need to repay that. For the SEOG, that's the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, that is also something that does not need to be repaid. So that is something for you, for the student to use throughout their college career. Now, we're going to look at the subsidized and unsubsidized federal loans. So when we're talking about the student loans on that sense, there's a big difference between subsidized and unsubsidized. So you just have to remember, subsidized does not accrue interest whereas unsubsidized loans does accrue interest throughout your college career. There's a fixed 4% interest rate currently for that. So again, like I mentioned, the accruing of interest, you wanna keep that in mind. Now you're gonna hear about the PLUS loan or it's also referred to as the parent loan. This is a loan solely for the parent to take out and it's the parent of the dependent child. They do run the credit of the parents, so you have to keep in mind of that as well. And currently, it's at a 7.54 interest rate, and it's moving upwards. So the parent can apply for this loan, and then they could request a deferment to pay off the loans. However, the loans does, does have to be paid off eventually. So some alternatives as well to consider are private lenders, for example. So be sure to check the terms and conditions when regarding the private lenders. So the question is, what now? What can I start with? What are the first steps? So when you essentially get your acceptance to a university or a college and you receive your financial aid offer or your financial aid package, you want to make sure you thoroughly review your financial aid award letters just to make sure you have all your ducks in a row and you understand everything that's being presented in case you do have any additional questions. Another thing, too, is to do the math. So I would always recommend the parent and the family and students to really spend a night just to sit down for about 30 minutes, right, and discuss these options, look at the schools you're applying to, and see the overall cost. Every website has a, or of the school, has a financial aid portion, right, to talk about the finances, but they also have a net price calculator. Now, this calculator is essentially going to be your best tool to use because you input your information and you can get a rough estimate as to what you're going to be paying to attend that school. It's not an exact, but it is a very good tool to use when you're looking at certain schools. Then the next thing, connect with your financial aid office of that respective school and ask them questions. Make sure you understand everything. Same thing, utilize your admissions counselors as well, right? Because they know a lot of information too, or they can direct you to a person who does. And then keep a record or a spreadsheet of your award letters, just in case you need them, at least you have them handy. Now, a big question too that we receive in admissions is also, can I negotiate these awards? Yes and no. So a lot of schools, you know, with merit awards based on your grades, those scholarships don't tend to be something that you can kind of negotiate, right? So for example, we assign a merit award or we give a merit scholarship based on the application and we award it at the time of their application. So there's no change. However, when we're talking about yes to negotiating, that's more on the financial side of it. So when you receive your financial aid offer and your full package, you're going to want to connect with the financial aid office to learn about their appeal process. The appeal process is a simple process that we can walk you through so you can have your financial aid offer reevaluated to see if there is any additional aid that the school could potentially give you. And then we also have the special circumstances and conditions appeal. So this is something to consider as well if there was a certain circumstance that happened within the family, like a medical circumstance or something regarding the job of the parent or so on. So definitely you want to make sure you inquire about this if that's the scenario. 
Helpful hints and resources as well, like I mentioned, is that net price calculator, but it's also financial aid and school websites too. So not only of the school, but just general websites based on FAFSA.gov, for example, they have a lot of useful information. And then ask this, each school about their aid process, because again, not every school is the exact same. But also remember the aid varies between student to student and then school to school, as well as year to year. So every student's financial aid offer will be different. No one's is ever going to be the same. And then the last thing I would recommend too, is if you can look into private scholarships, start applying to those as well, at least one or two a day, because then they do start to ac accumulate and you can use that for your overall cost for your university. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. And I am open to questions and answers if possible. Okay, I see a question. It is saying, how would money saved in a 529 account affect financial aid for merit participation or need-based assistance? Yes, so if you have money saved in a certain account, really what I would recommend is connecting with the financial aid office of that school, because like I said, it is different between every school and every student. So at least they can kind of guide you to see how that money can be used toward their overall aid. Um, I'm not too well versed in the 529 account. However, my recommendation stands. Always inquire within that financial aid department just so they can kind of give you a breakdown of everything and essentially guide you to the right place. Okay, we have another question. Mm -hmm. Are the CSS and the FAFSA completed by the student with the help of parents? Yes, I would always recommend that. I would always recommend the student um, to ask for the parents' help, at least so you're doing it together, um, just because they might ask questions. Like I mentioned for FAFSA, for example, they're going to ask questions about the parent as well and those parent demographics. So make sure you're using the student's information, for example, for like the ID, um, but they are going to ask about parent information so you can complete those together. Could you potentially um, answer a question about the Excelsior Scholarship, the New York State programs um, for financial aid? Is Yes, so um, I do know Iona, per, I'm just using us as an example. Um, we don't typically have an Excelsior Scholarship, if I'm not mistaken, however, some schools do. Um, so when you're talking about the Excelsior Scholarship, what you're going to do again is inquire within their financial aid to make sure they have it, and that could be utilized for the student. Um, more information regarding that, I can for sure, if there are any specific questions, I can do more research and get back to you with an appropriate answer. I agree. There's another question for students with divorced parents. I read that New York State aid only takes into account the primary parent's income. Is this true? and particularly for the Excelsior Scholarship. Right, so for aid, I do know they take the primary parent's income, correct. So um, I know with the new changes of FAFSA and everything, they're going to take that primary parent, especially the de um, with you know their dependent. So correct, that is what the requirement is, for example. Okay, there's another question asking, approximately how much does it cost at Iona and how much aid can a student get? Yes, so I'll give rough estimates for numbers as well. So at Iona specifically, if we're talking about tuition and fees, that's about 45,000 for the year. If we're talking about food and housing or room and board, that's about 18,000 a year. So we're looking at a total of almost 65,000 a year. Now that's everyone's sticker price. So sticker price is also a term that you're going to be hearing a lot. So that's your starting cost. So at Iona, we do give merit scholarships to our accepted students, and that's a wide range. So let's say a minimum of 10,000 and a maximum of 25,000. Not only the merit-based aid, we also have additional awards. So if the student you know, qualifies for the honors program, that's a scholarship, community service, performing arts. These are those participation-based aids, additional awards that you can kind of stack. Um, and that will help with the overall cost or an on-campus housing award. Our on-campus housing award is $3,000 every year if they decide to live on campus. Not only that, when a student 
fills out their FAFSA and receives their financial aid, that's also going to play an important role. For the FAFSA amounts, again, every student's different, so I can't speak on a certain amount for, you know, I can't say definitely 5000 or 2000 because it depends on every student. However, the merit-based aid, those are our ranges and the awards vary. So for community service, it's an additional, let's say, 1000 for your first year. Performing arts tends to be 2000 every year. So once you start adding them, it's um, it's manageable. It's It's something worth considering. Great. Could you also mention a little bit about need blind versus need aware in the admissions process? Yes. So need blind, um, essentially, or need aware, right, is something where you know you need you. Actually, let me let me just backtrack one second. So full need met, right? So when you're full need met, that means you meet the requirements. So need blind means we don't look at you know what your need is. If you're need aware, right, you're looking at based on your income and your family, okay, this is what you should be applying for. This is what you'll be receiving. Um, when, let's say we're talking about the difference between the two, like I said, every student is different from that. Um, again, I'm not too well versed on that end of it. That's as much information as I can give for you. However, that is something that I personally will be looking into a little more. Okay, great. Another question about Iona. What are the new benefits for students now that Iona has university status? Yes. So now that we have university status, just that just means we're expanding and we're adding more. So in terms of, let's say, the programs, right, students now have the opportunity to go into the health sciences. I'm using that as an example because that tends to be one of our popular programs. So not only that, we're also adding for sports. So it's more on the student's involvement within the school as well. In terms of scholarships, um, I know community service isn't, this isn't the first year we're doing it. However, it is one of our newer additional scholarships too. So those are some of the opportunities that we're offering students with this new university status. Now with more study abroad opportunities and um, new additions to the school, I can't, you know, within the next coming years, we're gonna announce more as well. Um, but that's essentially why we're at university now is because we're expanding, we have more to offer in terms of clubs and different programmings for students. Okay, terrific. Um, is there an online platform that you would suggest um, to compare and research scholarships? Yes, definitely. So when you're talking about online platforms, um, to research certain scholarships. Usually the students can look up scholarships based on you know, the school's website if they're looking for those particular scholarships. If you're talking about the private scholarships, I know if you just Google private scholarships, they do come up. Sometimes it's um, fastweb.com, right? That tends to be a popular one um, of, for private scholarships, but then certain schools would recommend them as well. So Iona has on our website recommenders for those private scholarships. So those are the online platforms I would suggest for. Okay, great. Um, and there's also a net price calculator that you can mm -hmm. kind of get some, you know, kind of an estimate as well. So I know that a lot of people use that and find that very helpful. Um, exactly. And another person asks, if you don't anticipate qualifying for any financial aid, does the student still have to fill out and submit FAFSA or CSS profile to schools? Yes, I would recommend so, even if you don't think you're going to get any aid, just because you don't want to leave money on the table, right? So it would always still be beneficial to at least apply for that, because at least you tried. The worst thing you know is that you don't receive aid, but at least you had a sense of it, but definitely still fill out those profiles just in case. Okay, terrific. Um, another question is, with the recent ruling on affirmative action, how do you take marginalized students into consideration? Yes. Um, so we review our students all equally as well. So I know there has been talk with different um, considerations for different students coming from different incomes as well. Again, we, I guess because we're a private institution too, in terms of like merit-based aid, for example, we don't evaluate students differently. We look at a student holistically. So we'll look at exactly what they're involved in. We don't nitpick on certain things and use that against the student ever, right? We're never going to look for something to negatively impact the student. So if they do well in school, then that's what we're considering for their merit-based aid, right? If they're participating in a certain thing, that's what we're going to consider. 
based on the income side of things, right? Just because we only look at the FAFSA, not the CSS profile, what you fill out on the FAFSA and your tax information is what we look at to render a full package for the student. There's no um, difference that we're coming out with currently. Okay. Um, one other question that I have is just wondering like what people would do if they had a circumstance that causes their income to change. So, you know, it's a year prior prior that you're using the tax returns, but but how about in the current year, you know, there's a loss of a job or how do you how do you express that on a financial aid form? Yes. So for that, that would um, kind of go into the special circumstances. Um, I'm sorry, the special circumstances or the conditions form. So that would be inquiring within the financial aid department of the certain school you're applying to. So you can access that form. So they're going to connect with you in terms of how to fill out the form as well. So because if you lost a job or like I mentioned earlier, if there was a certain medical circumstance, then you would look into that special conditions form. And then that would have Again, it's different for every family, but then that would have a kind of breakdown tailored towards you because of your certain condition or your certain certain um, circumstance based off that. Okay, very good. Does anyone have any more questions? All right, well, I really appreciate, Danielle, all of the information you gave us. Oh, actually, we got one more question, mm -hmm. just in time. Um, how, mu how much parent income affects aid for the student? Is there an income level where no aid is given? That's a great question, actually. So I, I um, there are certain bars, let's say, that a parent qualifies for certain aid, right? So that I would recommend to look on the FAFSA website to know the specific amounts for that. But I know the changes of FAFSA now with looking at the student aid index, for example, there is a wider range given too. So for EFC, let's say the minimum was zero. Now it's actually negative 1500, right? So there's a wider range for consideration to give for students. However, I would recommend looking onto that FAFSA website just for the specific amounts on that for the income based. Um, usually the school's financial aid office are the ones who kind of look at the level, right, or their income and to see what can be given in terms of grants and how much grants can be given in terms of uh, the award amount can be given. So um, for a Pell Grant, for example, there's a certain amount, like some students receive 2,000, some students receive 5,000. It really depends on that, but we leave that to the financial aid office to determine. Okay. Looks like there are no more questions. One last thought or question. Um, if parents have any kind of questions or concerns, can they contact the college's financial aid office to get some help with how to fill out the FAFSA if they have some questions? 100% they can. So the financial aid office is always available as well, usually Monday through Fridays for certain schools, nine to five. So you can always give them a call or send them an email or book an appointment online. There are various options for them. Or you could also call the school specific admissions counselor or your child's admissions counselor as well, because either they can help you or they can direct you to somebody who can. That's excellent. Well, I thank you so much, Danielle, for giving us all of this helpful information. And I thank all of you for attending to this evening. I hope you found it as informative as I have um, and definitely wish everybody luck in this application season. And the counselors will be available for questions in our offices whenever they come up. So thank you very much and have a great evening.